So, how would you actually characterize that? All descending. Okay. So, who is it specifically that he is doing this to? The one guy who insulted him. Do you remember his name? What? Oh, no, Does it start with an S? That's what I can do. I know where I find it. Yeah, it's Broadsea. Broadsea. So Broadsea is an athlete. I told you, right? Talk about that. So Broadsea is a Venetian athlete who challenges slash insults. This is, okay. And so, yeah, what is the deal with the names in this chapter? Because the names are a little bit different. Yeah. They're all of names associated with sea, but they each name people who are like seafarers. Yes, so all the names are associated with people who are sailing and who are at sea. So it does kind of speak to what they do and who they are. And so all of the men who are kind of participating in these games are sailors. Um, and so that's kind of a, a helpful thing for us to just kind of consider when we think about setting and how setting ties into the rest of the story. In this case, Homer makes it very easy for us to associate setting with well, uh, what the Phaeacians are as characters who are contributing to the plot of the story. Okay, Joe. So, we'll start with the beginning. Like, you start with the beginning, dead. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dark, dark. Do you know what Oh, no, I'm trying to find the name. Oh, Dem Demodokos. Oh, he's like, no. he's a singer. So is he singing about the story of the lady who, like, cheated on her husband, and he, like, fought them? Yes. So if you remember last week, so, yeah, so Festus. All right, he's a god, son of Zeus. He's god of the forge and metalworking. He created the gold and silver dogs that are guarding Alcanus' palace. This is the story where he comes back up. So they're telling the story of where the Greek god Ares. Um, so Fest, let, let's take a step back. So Festus is married to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. Okay, and so Aphrodite cheats on her husband with Ares. All right, and so Hephaestus, uh, in order to kind of get revenge, traps them in the net that he forges, and then all the gods come and they them. Okay. So that is actually an example of, we do get a lot of myths from the Iliad and the Odyssey. And so a lot of what we know, like this is probably the most popular, that, that is the most popular story with Festus in it. All right, and that comes from the Odyssey. Okay. And so we've gotten to know a couple of other, the other Greek gods. So like I know the goddess of the sea, all right, Calypso as the daughter of Atlas. And what we come to know about Atlas also kind of comes from the Odyssey. We get a lot of detail there. All right, but a lot of these stories have you know nothing to really do with the Odyssey. It's a little bit more just to provide information about the Greek gods to the people who would listen to the story who would then read it after it was written down. Okay. All right. This is all written in Greek, right? Yes, ancient Greek. So how do we know that this whole thing? Actually, about Odysseus and not about the God comparing his son. <laughs> a what? Like, oh, right. So, I mean, it wasn't like we just found it and then we translated it from Greek into English. So, like, so it's been continued to be translated and written about for a long time. So, um, if you want to take it back to, so this was written in 1800 BC. And let's say that it was written then or translated in Rome, all right, after the first you know, couple of centuries, all right. A lot of people still spoke Greek. So Greek was the 
quote unquote national language of the Roman Empire. So if you spoke Latin, you primarily lived in Rome or in at least Italy. Okay? But if you lived in Spain or Gaul or Israel or North Africa, or you would speak Greek. Because that was the uh, empire's main language. Okay? And so since people, could, and a lot of people, especially in Rome, could speak both Latin and Greek, right? So if you can speak both languages, then there are going to be scholars and scribes who would then make translations of Greek works into Latin, all right? Just as there would be people who are translating the Old Testament in Aramaic into Greek and Latin, okay? So have you guys learned in theology class of the Vulgate? I did your report. Okay, yeah. So you guys just did your saints reports. Oh, no, this is last. So, oh, okay. I you guys just did your report. Oh, yeah. So Brian, you did Saint Jerome. Tell us about Saint Jerome. Was there Saint Jerome? He was like a hermit, and then he like one of his big things was that he did the translation of the Bible from like old Latin and like Hebrew into Latin. Yes. Yeah, so we had a Greek translation, we had a Hebrew translation, or you know, Aramaic translation and Hebrew translation, depending on which books we're talking about. But we did not have one that was written in Latin yet, so he is the first one to have translated it in Latin. So because it follows that process, it's not like we just translated this like 100 years ago. And so because we have that continuing process of translation, retranslation, and people who study the languages, that's how we know that the story is what it's about. That's usually the process it goes through. Okay? All right, so Odysseus is being annoying and obnoxious, kind of sitting in uh, boastful. So Brodsky is the Phoenician athlete who challenges slash insults Odysseus. And that's the key part here, too, right? So it can seem like he's coming off as condescending or boastful, right? But we do want to note that Brodsky is insulting Odysseus. So how does he insult Odysseus? Yeah. Doesn't he say that he's yeah. So what is that back basically? So in a very roundabout way, because usually when, you know, if we insult someone, we're usually pretty direct. This is a very roundabout way of saying what? With Brian? Yeah. So basically, Brodsky is uh, calling Odysseus, all right, weak and also old. All right, so remember that at this point, Odysseus is in his late 40s or early 50s, probably. And remember that we, you know, most people do not live to be that old in the ancient world, okay? Or at least into their 60s or 70s. So Odysseus, in some regard, is quite old or elderly, or at least not as strong as he used to be, supposedly, okay? And so because of someone who's kind of gone through what he has gone, but also because he has the reputation that he has, as a great leader and warrior, to then make this comment about his strength is actually quite demeaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe. It says, oh, well, sir, I'm not down to follow you. I think that's in a slight in a different part of the chapter. So this is like an exchange that occurs after over like two pages. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I don't remember just yeah. saying that you have the error. Just that's the iron. All right. So let's take a step back, though, too. So this is what Odysseus is doing. But why are they having games in the first place? Anyone who hasn't commented yet today? Brian, you talk today. Damn it, Why are they having games? Interesting. <laughs> All right, yeah, so why is that important? Why are they doing that? To give a good impression. Casey's a god. Okay, and what is, that good, what is that good impression going to do for them? So like again, last week we talked about how for them, every time a stranger comes into one of these courts, it seems very odd that we go out of our way to like throw a feast for all of them or entertain them the way that they do. So that goes for Telemachus when he goes to Nestor's palace. It goes for Telemachus when he's in Sparta. Now it's happening again when Odysseus comes to Phaeacia. Okay, so why is this something that will reflect positively on the Phaeacians? Because they're 
Any ideas, David? To just start getting hosts. Okay. All right. And so remember too, what what is the reason that they throw the feast for? So it's not just that they're good hosts. Why would they do it just for some random visitor? Lucas? Okay, right. So it means that they don't get that many visitors. They said he could be a god. And this has already told him that he's not, though. And uh, you know, usually the gods are pretty honest about that, I guess. But um, if the visitor, if they don't get very many visitors, what would those visitors do when they return home? So like, when you go on vacation and you come home, what, what, do, you, what do you tell people? Yeah. Possibly, yeah. We're kind of heading in the right direction. All right, but yeah, we can stop some curves. Excuse me, we can slow Yeah. So. Yeah. So if they treat him well, but then also if they host these games. Right, he will tell everyone else about the patients, and he will tell them about their athletic prowess and ability, right? So if you don't get many visitors and you want people to know about your kingdom or about the virtue and the values of your people, the best way to do that is to show someone. So that if you show them how capable or strong you are when you go back to your home, all right, and you can tell your people, then you have kind of spread your fame. It's basically like an advertisement for another city, state, or another culture. Okay. So, if you saw, has anyone there, has anyone ever seen like those Pure Michigan advertisements or billboards on the expressway? Yeah. Has anyone ever been to Michigan? All right. The CC, do the advertisements live up to the actual experience of visiting Michigan? I guess. So, like, if someone was deciding between, like, South Carolina, like the beach in South Carolina and Michigan, what would you say? Well, I'm going to go with my aunt, and it's pretty cold from the So, yeah, it's the best So, which one would you tell someone to choose? Michigan. Michigan, okay. So, if so if you were to tell your friends, like if they were trying to decide with their family where they were going to go, you telling them something versus what they might see in an advertisement is going to be more helpful to that person because theoretically you are someone they would trust as their friend, right? It's someone who has actually been there. So if you have stories and memories from Michigan that makes it a more compelling place to go, then that might influence what someone decides to do elsewhere. Now, this isn't necessarily in this influencing someone who's going to go visit Phaeacia, but when we're talking about diplomacy and the relationships between city-states, so remember all the Greek city-states gathered together to do a flight by Troy, to have positive relationships and images of the different city-states is going to be very, very beneficial. Okay? All right. And so this then is also then why Broad Sea insulting Odysseus is kind of a big deal, right? Because it does reflect poorly on the creations as Broad Sea is a prominent athlete in the city. Okay? So that's something worth noting. Okay? Now, I don't want to get too much more into the detail because of the ROJ tonight. This exchange between Broad Sea and Odysseus is going to be very, very helpful. So you might want to revisit that passage tonight. Okay? Jim. Yes, basically. Especially since there's no evidence to show that Odysseus is weak or anything like that. Okay, so Demodocus. So he, um, he is the one who is the entertainment while they are feasting. Yes.
All right, what else does he sing about besides Aphrodite and uh, Festus? Brian? Didn't he say that thing about Odysseus fighting Achilles? Uh, not Hercules. Achilles. Achilles, yeah. Is that what you said the first time? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Far away. Yeah, All right, so, and he also sings about the entire Trojan world of war at the end of the feast, right? So. And what effect does this have? As he is singing about the church more. Right. Uh, Odysseus is very sad about it. Yeah, so it's not just that he is sad, he kind of breaks down and starts weeping when he hears about all the stories about all the things that happened during the war. Okay. And while they're talking about all the victories and all the things that kind of occurred, uh, it just kind of serves up feelings and emotions of all the men that were lost, and all the things that were terrible that occurred. And so Odysseus kind of breaks down because, first of all, again, even now, it's been, you know, almost 10 years since the war ended. And this is the first time he has heard someone really talk about it because he's been trying to get home for that long. Okay. And so I guess at this point, this is when we'll switch over and talk about the RRJ for homework before we get into book nine, just because in those two things we just discussed, all right, there are things we get we learn about Odysseus that we did not know before. So tonight, for your reader response show, all right, in the two books, we've gotten to know Odysseus quite well. So in the first five books, we really only know Odysseus based upon what other people say about him, okay? And it basically revolves around the idea that he is a strong, brave, and good leader and warrior, okay? Um, but we, we learned a lot more about how complicated his character is. So, using what we learned specifically in the first quarter about character, all right, we want to use the STAR acronym, editorial comments, and appearance to help us learn more about Odysseus as a character, okay? So how can we use these tools to determine what kind of Odysseus is? Tell us more than what we already learned in the first four books about him being brave and strong, because there is much more we can discuss, all right? Um, so focus on checking these new characteristics that we learned about in book eight and nine, and because this is a combined journal for two books, I would like this reflection to be one written page, not just half a page, okay? And because we can go into detail, I want you to share your evidence for why you were saying he exhibits the different characteristics you bring up. All right, we should be able to kind of defend our position fairly strongly. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. Because when we talk about book nine, all right, now we have something else to consider. Okay, so what happens in book nine? The very beginning. Excuse me? Isn't there telling them what happened, like when he was trying to get home? Yes. So now we move from Phaeacia to basically him telling the story of. Oh. So he tells us about everything that has happened, okay, since he left Troy. Okay? And as we learn in Book 9, there are a lot of different things that happened that we have not learned or heard about yet. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about tomorrow then is... Now something else is building what we kind of really discussed in the first quarter, okay? And that is, is this story following the typical plot line, okay? How should we think about plot in this story? Now that we are uh, about a third of the way through the book, we have enough or have read enough that we should start to be able to kind of understand and think about what plot is actually like here and how that might influence our understanding of the story. Right. It's going to be sort of like the time machine where it's like he talks about what he did. 
Are you, are you talking about the one by Wells? Yes. Yes, yeah, I will. It will be like that. So for those of you who don't know, yes, the time machine is about a scientist who goes into the future and then tells the story of what happened as a flashback. So it's already happened, he's just telling everyone who stayed in the present what happened when he went back in time. Great. Um, yeah. So any questions before the bell rings? Alright. Yeah, CC? So, um, where uh, Cyclops, or I guess he's Cyclops, like, all that stuff, where do people, other people besides Prince, or Cyclops, or the monster, everything is? Where are there other people besides the There are other Cyclops. Oh. So, yeah, so earlier in the book, when they keep referencing the Cyclopians, so it's like a whole race of, and by race, I mean there's only like nine of them. Uh, but they're all sons of Poseidon, they all live on that island today. Yeah, so they're like, 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 they're like,